Center, Building Consumer Credit, a Winning Strategy for Financial Institutions and Consumers. I am Kate Marshall-Dole, and I'm an analyst on the Innovation and Research Team at CFSI. And I'm really excited to have here with me today three experts on credit building. Natalie Abadamarco, Managing Director at City Community Development, Vicki Frank, Founding Director of Credit Builders Alliance, and Ken Lin, CEO of Credit Karma. And I'd like to take a moment now to thank City Community Development in particular for their support. While the opinions I'll be expressing here today are solely those of CFSI, City has been a really valuable sponsor and supporter of the work that we've done in, in the area of credit building. And we really couldn't do all the work that we do at CFSI without the support of valuable partners like City. So we wanted to give them our thanks. So in a minute, I'll hand it over to Natalie to get us started. But before I do that, I wanted to give just a brief background on CFSI. CFSI is a nonprofit organization focused on transforming the US financial services marketplace to help underbank consumers achieve financial prosperity. So we do our work toward that mission in a number of different ways. We conduct market and consumer research to drive awareness of underbank consumers and the issues they face. We advise companies through consulting and through hosting convenings of industry innovators. We invest in innovative companies and solutions, both on the for-profit and nonprofit side. And through our policy team in DC, we use our market and consumer expertise to shape and inform policies affecting financial products and services for underserved consumers. So here's our agenda for today's webinar. We've got a full slate of speakers and lots of exciting content to share, as you can see here. Natalie will be kicking us off, and she'll set the stage about the importance of credit building initiative today. I'll come back on after Natalie finishes her comments and offer a CFSI framework for how financial institutions can support sustainable credit building for their customers. And then Ken Lin will get on next and give us some background on how the Credit Karma platform can help consumers build their credit profiles. Vicki Frank will then come on to discuss nonprofit partnerships and the importance of building positive credit history. And then finally, as we wrap up, Natalie will come back on for a few minutes to talk about how CFSI's credit building framework applies to the work that City's doing today in the area of credit building. And uh, with the time that we have left at the end, we'll answer your questions. So with that, I'd like to introduce Natalie Abedamarco from City Community Development. Natalie? Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this very important subject because as we all know, good credit is really key to economic security. And at City Community Development, we've been looking at this issue, um, and frankly, we're always trying to um, understand and tackle very complex problems. Um, and credit scoring um, you know, has presented um, itself as one of those. And we've been thinking about what, what first of all, do we need to understand? Um, and we really like to get under the hood of an issue um, so that we can not only understand the problem, but identify the strategies and the solutions that can help people, especially low and moderate income people, um, improve um, and really rebuild their um, uh, credit score. And this really is the, you know, the mission of, of uh, city community development is to help individuals and families and ultimately communities achieve economic empowerment. And we do this by trying to understand the needs of that community. And when you get to hear more about the work that we supported CFSI to do, you'll understand uh, exactly what went into the research paper and um, understanding credit. We certainly work with many, many not-for-profits. And I know I, I took a peek at the uh, RSVP list. So I know that there are lots of uh, our partners on the phone um, from from New York to California. Um, and then what we do is provide investments and funding opportunities for those organizations and those um, uh, programs. And then lastly, very, very committed to building capacity um, to uh, organizations and to um, um, other colleagues so that they too can understand the problem and tackle it in the same way that, um, that we can. So why focus on credit building um, is, a, is a good question. And, and as I said, it is something that we've been uh, talking about and focusing on quite a bit. And there's a couple of um, uh, issues and um, activities that have sort of all come together. And I thought that I would walk us through them because I think it's important 
to understand why now and what the opportunity is because of so much focus on this particular issue. And I, I'm going to go through these, but they're, they're really not in any particular order, um, just, um, you know, the, the, the way I'll talk about them. So the first thing um, has to do with the fact that legislation was passed, and in the Dodd-Frank Act of 2011 in July, um, it was required then that financial institutions provide a range of credit score information to its clients, especially when they were either denied access to credit or if they were offered credit uh, that had terms that were other than favorable for the product. And that really, um, you know, was the, is the goal and one of the tenets of the Dodd-Frank legislation and regulatory reform is to provide real transparency to our customers as well as to make sure um, and that they understand the information that they are getting. So when you think of the information that financial institutions uh, must provide, first of all, we have to provide a generic um, FICO score used to make the decision, whether it be a FICO or Vantage score. Uh, the range of possible scores of the scoring model, key factors that negatively impacted the score, the date on which the score was created, and the credit bureau that generated the score. So if you're anything like me, who's going 110 miles an hour, you can see that that's a lot of information and it's quite complex. So we realize that more consumers need to know about their credit score. And also, um, this information is good, but we wanted to also think about how to improve it. The other thing was consumer needs, that credit building is a really clear need for consumers at this point. Whether you've had an incident of you know, death, divorce, loss of a job, loss of a home, um, we still realize, and, and the, the data is, is quite startling, that 70 million people have a thin file or no credit file, and 56% of consumers say that they need help improving their credit score according to Consumer Federation of America. So we really, again, wanted to be able to address this need of our customers, of, the, of, of members of the community, so that they would be able to um, fend for themselves and think for themselves and figure out for themselves how they were going to improve credit score. Um, the fact is that there is a national um, decline in credit scores. And, um, and, that, and that speaks to the fact that there are real, um, a, a real need for credit rebuilding strategies. So post the recession, FICO reports that 31.9% of Americans have scores in the lower ranges, and that is the highest proportion since 2006. This is really a real serious um, situation, and of course, the consumer is really pretty confused. And I, I don't like to throw a lot of statistics, but these um, are, just, uh, are just, again, too startling not to um, ignore them. So 70% of consumers remain unaware of how costly credit scores can be. Um, and not only that, but CFA, Consumer Federation of America, also found that only 29% of Americans are aware um, of how costly that credit could be. So the, the point here is we know that credit scores um, are, are an indicator of how uh, much you're going to spend for credit, but we also know that it is an indicator now of whether or not you can get a job, what kind of an insurance you can get. Um, you know, how to rent a car. I mean, there's, there's lots of things now, even how to be a renter. So all of this information and all of these, um, you know, new variables are really coming at the consumer all at once. And certainly for us, and again, you know, I, I can speak for my institution, there really is no roadmap um, in terms of how to repair credit score as well as how quickly a credit score can be repaired. Um, in certain instances, you know, we've heard that a person who's had um, experience of foreclosure may take them seven years to repair their credit. Well, it's just not a good business model for us to wait for so many people for seven years 
to be able to enter into the, to the economic mainstream as well as the financial mainstream. So what we decided to do um, was look to some of our trusted partners to see what we can do to understand the problem a little bit more ad uh, adequately, as well as coming up with strategies and interventions that could be adopted by us and by others so that we can help uh, consumers, again, achieve their economic security. Back to you, Kate. Great. Thanks so much for providing that context, Natalie. So as, um, as I start to get into CFSI's framework a little bit for how financial institutions can support effective credit building solutions for consumers, I wanted to just start by quickly reviewing the mainstream credit scoring system. So there are several companies out there that compile and analyze data to evaluate consumer credit worthiness, but the market is really dominated by the big three credit bureaus, which are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So FICO is the most widely used scoring model, and it's the basis for the scores generated by the big three. And Vantage score is a competing scoring model that was created by the big three. Um, and both models look at things like payment history, credit utilization, and amounts owed to evaluate um, consumers' credit standing. Lenders use the scores that are provided by the bureaus in lots of different ways, and many lenders also use additional information that they gather on their own and analyze to make decisions about extending credit. Um, so credit scores really serve to make the credit system more efficient and they reduce the cost of credit to consumers overall. However, as Natalie just mentioned, many people today find themselves in lower score bands, um, sort of in the wake of the financial crisis, and that makes accessing high quality credit more difficult. Millions more have thin or no credit file, meaning that there's little or no information in the traditional bureau system to document their repayment behaviors. And so the dilemma for these consumers is that it takes a credit score to be able to borrow from lenders, and yet it's impossible to develop a good credit score without using credit products that get reported into the system. So before I dive um, deeply into CFSI's credit building framework, I want to step back for just a minute and talk about financial capability. Financial capability is really a new way of thinking about financial education, um, and it emphasizes behavior change rather than simple knowledge gain. So we talk about the two concepts of financial capability and credit building in parallel because the most successful credit building initiatives will also make consumers more financially capable. CFSI has come up with four traits that are common to initiatives that are most successful at promoting financial capability, and those are relevant, timely, actionable, and ongoing. And so by relevant, we mean addressing consumers' specific concerns and financial situations, ideally in a relevant context, um, in order to capture their attention and motivate them to change. And timely, in the sense that guidance is coinciding with key life events or decision points that can provide immediate feedback. Actionable means that the intervention enables consumers to put newly gained knowledge immediately into action in ways that can improve their financial situation. And finally, in order to help consumers improve their financial capability, interventions should be ongoing and developed over the course of a long-term relationship that provides support, instills a sense of accountability, and tracks the consumer's progress. In our research, we came across lots of good credit building solutions, but we didn't see many examples of solutions that are available at scale. So we think banks and credit unions have really a critical role to play in bringing scale to the innovations that are already available, but that have limited reach. Um, and so our framework, as you can see here, is divided up into strategies that can be implemented in the short term, the medium term, and longer term. The short-term solutions are meant to be the least labor and cost intensive, and the medium and longer-term solutions will require a more significant effort by financial institutions themselves, and in some cases, require some industry-wide, more systemic changes. As we develop this framework, we sort of imagined a hypothetical low or moderate income borrower who approaches a financial institution looking for some type of credit. We imagined that the borrower is turned away because of either damaged credit for a past mistake or over indebtedness or because of having a thin credit file or no file. And what we did was we set out to come up with alternative strategies that banks and credit unions could take to actually keep that customer in the door rather than sending them away. And our belief from the beginning, which has really been borne out as we've delved deeply into this area, was that financial institutions could really benefit by identifying strategies for serving these customers. So we've categorized our short-term recommendations as credit building tools, services, and partnerships. 
the medium term recommendations generally fit within the category of risk limited credit building products and our longer term recommendations emphasize looking beyond traditional credit files to consider new and deeper sources of data for credit decisioning. So in the short time we in the, excuse me in the short term we identified four ways that banks and credit unions can help customers build their credit profiles. So the first is to connect customers to online and mobile enabled credit score tracking tools. Credit Sesame and Credit Karma are two providers of the type of tool that we're talking about. Um, and of course, you'll hear more from Ken Lin shortly about Credit Karma. But these tools are valuable because they can help consumers regularly track their credit scores. And this type of ongoing tracking can really help consumers see exactly how their behaviors impact their credit scores. The second piece here is to connect customers to per personal financial management or PFM tools or to build your own. So PFM tools are similar to the credit tracking tools in that they're generally online enabled sort of tech based tools that consumers can access um, on their own. But they, these types of PFM tools paint a more comprehensive picture of a person's finances. So for LMI consumers, these tools can begin to play the role that a financial advisor plays for more affluent uh, consumers. And um, so while these tools aren't specifically designed to help consumers understand their credit profiles, they can be useful in this context in that they can help users see how their credit use connects to their broader financial lives. So the next piece is to partner with nonprofits to offer high-touch products and services. And you'll hear much more about partnerships with nonprofits later in the webinar from Vicki Frank. So I'll just preview the concept here. But nonprofits are often especially well positioned to meet consumer needs. They can offer services like coaching and counseling or referrals to financial institutions or even basic product offerings provided directly to consumers. And when nonprofits partner with financial institutions to offer a service to customers, it can really benefit everyone involved. The financial institution gets access to a solid pipeline of future customers. The nonprofit partner gets needed support for their program and consumers get guidance or support that may be more hands-on than what a financial institution could offer on its own. And finally, the last short-term recommendation is to connect customers to online and offline debt management programs. And so this is really related to consumers who have become over-indebted. And for these consumers, there are a number of both online and offline services that may be helpful. So programs like Savvy Money and Ready for Zero um, can help provide online assistance and programs to help pay down debt. And in the offline world, credit counseling programs are available that can help consumers consolidate and pay down their debts. So the role I think that banks and credit unions have to play here is really important because from a consumer's perspective, it can be really tough to navigate the many providers in this market, some of whom are not operating with the customer's best interest in mind. So getting advice from a trusted financial provider can make a customer feel more comfortable with a given debt counseling solution. And this has real potential to benefit the provider as well because consumers are then likely to come back to that financial institution once they've resolved their credit issues and have additional financial services needs. So for those financial institutions that want to take an additional step toward helping that hypothetical customer who's initially not eligible for a credit product, another option is to offer what we call risk limited or credit building products. So relative to the referrals and technology-based solutions and partnerships in the short-term recommendations, these initiatives will require more effort and expense, but they also offer greater potential reward for banks and credit unions. So secured cards are one type of credit building product that banks and credit unions can offer. These cards are secured by a cash deposit, which limits the risk to the consumer and to the financial institution. And it also offers an opportunity for consumers to build their credit scores. These products are actually offered fairly widely in the market today, but they're often not promoted in a, in a very proactive way, so a lot of consumers don't even know about them. Small unsecured lines of credit are another option, and so these aren't secured with collateral, but the risk in offering this type of product is still mitigated because it's a relatively small amount of credit that's being extended. And um, with any type of credit building or risk limited credit product, a good practice is to establish loan terms that improve with good behavior. So as one example, you might offer graduation to a partially secured or unsecured credit product over time. Or another approach could be to offer APR reductions for customers who stay within their credit limit or pay on time for consecutive billing cycles. So with these products, effective marketing is key. 
I mentioned a minute ago that there are a lot of secured cards out there, but they're not being widely promoted. Um, and you know, since these products aren't relevant to all consumers, um, banks and credit unions really need to be targeted in how they offer them and to whom. So staff training and sales incentives may be helpful in motivating the staff and eventually expanding the reach of these products. Natalie and I both alluded earlier to the millions of consumers in the U.S. who are thin or no file. And so these consumers don't have a complete record of borrowing history within the traditional re credit reporting system. But just because they haven't used vehicles like credit cards and mortgages to any significant degree does not in any way indicate that they can't borrow responsibly. Really many of these consumers have demonstrated responsible repayment behavior through their use of a deposit account or through the payment of bills like utilities, cell phone, or rent. In cases where a lender already has an account relationship of some kind with a thin or no-file customer, there are several data points that could be mined for underwriting purposes. So things like tenure with the bank, current and past relationships with the bank, deposit account, excuse me, deposit account balances and behaviors, overdraft history and savings balances and behaviors are just a few examples. So what we found in our research was that many lenders are plumbing this data that they have in half to some extent, but most are not making full use of these types of data points. And so for the customers who you don't already have an account relationship with, third-party data and analytics companies like L2C and LexisNexis gather and analyze payment um, data for things like rent and utilities, which are much more likely to be used by LMI consumers. And so one last emerging area that CFSI is keeping a close watch of that I wanted to tell you about is the potential use of GPR prepaid card usage information for credit evaluation. Um, as many of you probably saw, when Susie Orman came out with her approved prepaid MasterCard early this year, the company said it would share transaction data with TransUnion so that the Bureau could evaluate whether that data could be predictive. And in a similar way, American Express has a program called Make Your Move that enables their prepaid card customers to be invited to apply for a charge card after developing a good track record. And so, you know, there are obvious potential privacy concerns around the sharing of customer data, so it's important for providers to weigh the risks and benefits of sharing this data, but we see it as a real positive that this could lead to additional data in the system that could help expand access to high-quality credit for LMI consumers. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ken Lin to talk about Credit Karma. Great, thank you. Uh, so at a really high level, I just wanted to give a little overview of, of what we are at Credit Karma. So uh, we're a service that actually provides free credit score access to our members. Uh, we have a pretty strong belief that uh, access and education are, are fairly limited in the marketplace. Um, so we've built a suite of tools and products that can help consumers, but at the same time have a business model built in to help us uh, pay for all the costs. So just jumping into slide two, I, I took a lot of uh, you know the same learnings. This is a uh, Consumer Federation study uh, that, that Natalie also referenced. But it's amazing to me that only 42% of consumers actually reported receiving one of their credit scores uh, within the last year. And of that 42%, about half of them actually reported um, getting access through their bank. So, you know, banks and credit unions really are an important aspect of how consumers are accessing their credit scores. Uh, we're hoping to mitigate that through our platform, but also some of our white label solutions that I'll walk you through shortly. Uh, you know, I think the 29% metric is also referenced in the sense that consumers just don't understand how important uh, good credit is when it comes to affecting their financial well-being, uh, you know, in the form of higher interest rates and other fees. Um, also important and, and kind of one of the things that we very much allude to in addition to our access component on credit card is education. Um, or more than half of consumers don't understand that age, marital status, and a lot of other components aren't actually um, affected, uh, well, those things aren't included in your credit score. There's just a lot of bad myths and misconceptions around credit, and one of the things that we do at Credit Karma is build tools around dispelling those misconceptions as well as teaching consumers how credit works. So, uh, you know, jumping into the next slide here, um, in terms of the, the Credit Karma platform, uh, our fundamental belief is that every consumer should have an access, have rights and access to their own credit report. And that's what we've done with our platform. So just to give you a sense of, of you know, all of our tools, the first thing that we do is um, our, our platform is completely free. There's no negative opt-out or you know, deceptive practices around promoting as a free credit score. Uh, we don't even ask for a credit card as part of the registration process. Uh, 
another key part of you know what we provide in Credit Karma is that we do proactive credit monitoring. So this is the same feature that a lot of subscription services do. Um, so on a nightly basis, we'll monitor for seven key interactions, things like delinquencies or new inquiries or new accounts, and we'll send an email or push notification the following day if we see one of those particular actions. So really, again, uh, the, the access component is, is one of the fundamental beliefs. Um, in addition to those, search, uh, those features, one of the other things that consumers really like are, are what we call our credit report card. So one of the things that we've noticed in the marketplace are that uh, credit reports are very difficult to understand for the average consumer. Uh, you know, they can literally be 10 pages long and have so much information that a consumer gets inundated and you know, overwhelmed with just the, the sheer amount of numbers and figures. So our credit report card is an attempt to simplify your credit report. What we do is we give you seven metrics. We use a simple A to F rating system, things like on-time payment, things like um, you know, utilization, and we'll grade you and we'll tell you, you know, you're a B and this is why you're a B and here's what you need to do to get to an A. So very simple ways to understand credit and to put it into context for consumers. Um, in addition, uh, one of our, our most popular tools is a credit score simulator. So uh, a credit score simulator actually will uh, allow a consumer to simulate uh, specific actions. So we take popular actions like going 30 days delinquent or uh, you know, increasing a uh, credit limit or applying for a new credit and its actual impact. I think one of you know, our approach is that one of the problems with the credit scoring system is that it was really built for banks and as a result it becomes very difficult for consumers to understand. And uh, you know, by building these tools, we think that putting into context, putting into relevance, will actually put a lot more uh, uh, knowledge in you know in the hands of the consumer. And lastly, what uh, kind of ties into our business model and also is a benefit for consumers is we can actually help consumers evaluate their existing loan products. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's you know a little bit about our our business model is that. Uh, you know, we've got all these great free services, but all of them are, are based on uh, an advertising model on the site. So we pay for the credit scores, we buy them from TransUnion, uh, and then we actually use the advertising to, to offset those costs. So that's a little bit about the, the Credit Karma platform. Uh, on slide four, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what it looks like for a consumer in terms of accessing a credit score. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from a very long time ago is that consumers need to understand the correlation of their everyday actions to their credit score. It's very difficult to target in or hone in on you know, a good credit score if you can't see what happens when you've gone 30 days delinquent or when you've paid down your bills. So uh, because of that, we've our platform allows consumers to access their credit score on a daily basis. We track that data over time. It's going to let this fire truck go by. All right, thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that we do is allow that daily access. So if you've missed a payment, you can see the score drop. Or if you've you know, paid down your debt, you can see the score increase. We think that's a really important aspect of credit scores. Um, in addition, we actually are trying to provide as many credit scores as possible. So within our framework, we currently support three credit scores. One's a trans risk score. Another one's the Vantage score that's been mentioned. And we also have an auto insurance score. Um, one of our perspectives, our, our, our philosophy at, at Credit Karma is to provide as much information as possible. Um, so we're always looking for additional credit scores, additional credit score sources to provide more information to consumers. Um, and really in the last piece is again, you know, we think that the, the monitoring service is really an important aspect of this so that even if you can't be proactive as a consumer, we as a service can be proactive in helping consumers find the irregularities as well as find the you know, identity and, and potential other credit risk factors within a consumer's credit report. Um, next I'm going to talk a little bit about simple interactive tools. So this is probably the most, uh, most popular tool on Credit Karma today, which is our credit score simulator. What we found in the marketplace is that because credit scores are so complicated, you'll often see a lot of generic or somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat generalized uh, sets of approaches in building your credit. But the, the, the reality is that many consumers are in different situations and by giving the general advice, none of it is actually very uh, applicable. So our credit score similar actually will allow consumers to simulate um, changes within their credit report 
based on their specific user report. So it's not some generic algorithm or it's not based on a bunch of averages. It's actually based on a consumer's credit report. Uh, we found that you know consumers will often simulate four or five interactions on you know just their first login. Um, you know the, the tool uh, tells you how much your score is predicted to change. It tells you why it's changing, and it gives you again a lot of that perspective. Um, it helps consumers make trade-off decisions. You know, should I become 30 days delinquent on my uh, you know on my credit card, or should I you know skip the lattes every day? Right. I mean, I, I think those are sorts of pieces of information that consumers really need to understand uh, to, to, to balance their financial situation. And without that without these sorts of tools, it becomes very disjointed. It becomes uh, somewhat uh, you know, nebulous. You have no idea what's actually going to happen to your credit, what the actual ramifications are. Um, so this tool was actually created in conjunction with TransUnion. So we're actually doing real-time pings, uh, changing the report, or, or I guess changing the scenario, sending it after TransUnion to have it rescored. So, you know, again, this is just a simple idea of how consumers and how, you know, uh, banks and financial institutions can leverage these sorts of teaching techniques to, to really get consumers on board with uh, understanding credit. Uh, you know, again, something that just traditionally hasn't happened. I've talked a little bit about uh, the credit report card already, but this is, again, you know, an example of how that, how that looks. The idea with the credit report card is that it's very overwhelming. Uh, nobody wants to really comb through 13 pages worth of credit reports. Uh, they're fin files. It, it might not be quite as bad, but again, you know, it, without context, you don't understand well what is 100% on time payment. So, in in our credit report card approach, uh, everything's built down or drilled down into a uh, a to F letter grade. Uh, we will provide you statistics. We'll provide you reasons why a particular score is what it is the direction and the things you need to do to improve that grade. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, it, it just comes down to basics. And, and I think for a lot of consumers, it starts with the basics. Trying to teach a consumer everything about credit and credit scores is an impossible task they want. So our approach is to take it into small bite-sized pieces that consumers can digest that are actionable uh, and that are also trackable, right? So the idea here is that every time you log into Credit Karma, We'll actually look for the changes in your credit report. We'll show you the particular change and also the ramifications on your grade. So, you know, all, all contextual um, and all targeted to the consumer and their specific file. Um, on the next slide, what we're really focusing on here is, well, how does Credit Karma make money? How does a bank or how does a, you know, partner of Credit Karma get into this model in, in a way or, or even build their own platform where it's either, uh, you know, cost neutral or cost positive? So one of the things that we do uh, to mitigate the cost of all of the credit data that we're building is we actually are in this, this advertising model. And here I just want to simply illustrate how some banks are thinking about it. So as part of the data that we collect at Credit Karm, we actually have access to a consumer's credit file along with the interest rates and the different loan amounts that they're doing. So, you know, very much in line with our philosophy of helping consumers, we actually evaluate a lot of their loans. So in this particular example, we are actually evaluating uh, an auto loan that a consumer might have. Uh, and we can actually look at their APR, we can actually then look at their APR against their credit profile, and we can see if they are high uh, or paying too much you know, against market rates. And if they are, we'll actually make a recommendation to help them cross-sell into a refinance product that might you know, lower their monthly payments. Again, this is, uh, this is how Credit Karma makes their money, but in many ways, I think this is how banks and, and financial institutions can think about uh, subsidizing or offsetting some of the costs in their program uh, by allowing you know, something that's non-subscription-based, you know, non, uh, something that has you know, tremendous value to the consumers, but also can have a lot of value to the banks and financial institutions involved. So again, in this example, it shows how you know the consumer might be eligible to lower their rate, and in so doing, lowering their payments by $100. Uh, if that happens, then you know Credit Karma would make uh, an advertising fee, the bank would get a new customer, and hopefully the consumer would be saving $100 a month. So again, just a really interesting way and dynamic to helping you know both financial institutions, the bank, and the actual platform itself. Uh, and then in terms of the last slide, you know I, I think there are some. Some, some people out there are like, well, that's great, but it really is a little bit of a, uh, a conflict for me to, you know, show a competing offer. So 
our platform itself will provide a white label solution. I've uh, I've just provided three here. One's at Citibank, Sears, another one is Capital One, and another one is University of Wisconsin Credit Union. But we have about two dozen white label partnerships. Uh, in those partnerships, we will provide the service. Uh, sometimes they'll be you know on a per user basis. Uh, sometimes it won't be if we if we can figure out the right cost components. We're fairly flexible, but. Again, the idea here, and, and very much aligned with uh, CSFI, is let's leverage the scale of financial institutions to get access out there. And with the white label solution, we hope to address all of those issues uh, by giving you the branding and, and, and the other uh, key components that you might want. Uh, but while, you know, as a bank or financial institution, not having to build out a whole product set around access or education, a lot of those things have already been figured out on the platform. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Kate. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, and next, we'll hear from Vicki Frank. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everybody. This is Vicki Frank, and I am at, at Net Credit Builders Alliance. Um, we are a nonprofit that was actually seed funded by both CFSI and City was one of our original funders and continuing funder as well to help us really work with nonprofits to create innovative solutions where nonprofits around the United States can help low-income families build credit and financial access to grow both their business and personal assets. Um, we really got started because we recognized on the next slide that good credit really um, does provide access for most business transactions, as Natalie referred to earlier. Um, it's really not just about the cost of credit, but the cost of where you're renting your apartments and how, um, your access to telephones and utilities, um, your access to getting a job. But that really, um, what we were understanding was that um, Individuals and entrepreneurs and, and communities with lower per, poor traditional credit had very few opportunities to access responsible financial products that build good credit. Um, and, and you know, a little bit of a reference to that rent and bills and telephones and prepaid cards and payday loans and used cars and buy here, pay here all really don't report into the traditional credit um, scheme. Um, and so the, the different kinds of financial transactions that most, you know, low and income minority communities often have access to locally and easily um, really don't help them, um, while they may have good credit, may not help them build a traditional good credit score. And um, we really do um, want to get across how much savings can happen. And we've seen quotes as high as up to $250,000 that are working lives and interest and fees when we have good credit as opposed to poor credit. Um, and really we've been focusing then on that credit building is really that establishing of a good long-term positive um, credit history through positive reported responsible payments. And so um, thinking about that is a little bit distinct from debt, um, which is a liability defined by what we owe. And so if we think about our balance sheet, right, we always have assets that, that balance our debts. And so the debts are obviously the, what, how we've used credit already, what money we owe, that money may be in collections, those, those debts may be in collections, and, and credit repair may be really important. Um, but that we also have this asset, which is our credit worthiness. Um, and so we're really focused on that um, in terms of thinking then about the credit report in a really different way and what happens if we start thinking about it as somebody's financial resume. I flipped on to the next slide. Um, and really helping people own a little bit um, and think forward thinking about what kind of skills and relationships, which kind of are those references that we have on our real resume, that can help people think two to three years out about what do we want our credit report to look like, our financial resume, the skills that we want to demonstrate in terms of our credit worthiness, and how are we going to get there. And we've learned a lot of different things about one of the biggest issues often is that thin file or no file, it's, it's that gap on your credit report. And we find that that is really much more than just an immigrant or a refugee or um, somebody new to credit that has an insufficient file. I've seen 16-page credit reports that are still thin files because it may just be a bunch of you know, old payday loan collections or medical debt or somebody had an emergency and lost their job and couldn't pay bills for a while, but no active credit that they can start to build good credit with. And we, we all know when we're working with people that in terms of getting a new job that we often help people think into the future about what, what, do, what do we want your skills to say about you tomorrow? Where do you want to go with this credit report instead of only focusing on maybe some of the faults and issues and problems we've had in the past? Um, and, and so really focusing that way. Um, so we really implement our work through three main activities. Um, we have innovative products and services, um, which are our reporter and access. And so we really provide an opportunity and a platform for nonprofits all over the country to be able to 
make loans and report those loans to credit bureaus and, um, and or pull credit reports so they can do better financial coaching. We then focus a lot on knowledge sharing. And this for us um, references a lot of what both Natalie and Ken were talking about in terms of the lack of consumer knowledge. And so really working through nonprofits to help them both understand the importance of credit um, as an asset for their clients, understanding some of the credit scoring, but they can impart this information to their consumers and demystify the myth. And um, for instance, we've had a couple of really good webinars recently where we learned that Vantage Score ignores all collections under $250. Um, we're also always on kind of um, credit reporting industry and, and thinking about the future. And in 2013, they're really re-looking at how medical debt and student loans are impacting people today and how the economy may have changed and whether or not credit scoring needs to change with it with respect to different kinds of, of debt and loans. So we're really excited to be able to continue to partner and um, impart that information to hundreds of nonprofits who we know are serving tens and hundreds of thousands of, um, of consumers and entrepreneurs. And finally, um, credit outcome tracking. Um, but in terms of um, our credit products and services, we'll go to the next slide. The CBA, as I mentioned, um, we started in 2007 with a lot of support from CFSI and City. Um, and we now serve over 125 nonprofits who are reporting over 16,000 loans. Each loan is helping a consumer and entrepreneur who otherwise probably would not have had access to positive credit um, to report that loan, to have an opportunity to pay on time, and to build a meaningful credit history. And we're also helping, I think now we actually have over 300 CDA members in all um, who are accessing um, tens of thousands of credit reports that they can use that for financial coaching. They can really help um, their consumers understand the credit reports. As, um, as Ken was talking about, that's, that's a huge issue. Um, so, so that's really what we're doing in terms of our products and services. We're really focused on our outcome tracking now as well. And this has really, um, I think, been a huge boost to the partnership possibilities between nonprofits and um, banks. For, um, I'm on the next slide. For many nonprofits, um, their work for the last couple of decades has really been focused on helping create bank customers. And there's been lots of conversation around how nonprofits' role can really be that high touch role in communities to work with um, consumers and entrepreneurs and help think about what skills they need, what education and knowledge, and also hopefully what behavior change and financial capability they need to be really good bank customers. And it's been a very demand focused. And so we really feel that bringing credit outcome tracking into this, using credit reports and credit building as a financial capability tool to not only change knowledge but behavior, really gives those nonprofits and a bank a, a level playing field to talk about um, or recognize indicators. And so for nonprofits, um, credit reports and using these in coaching can be a really cost-effective and longitudinal measure of financial behavior. You can actually see new relationships starting, better on-time payments happening, um, you know, clients who, who, who understand they're building a resume with, with reported information. And banks can now recognize and obviously recognize this as an indicator of consumer readiness and success for the kinds of products and services that they have, which includes everything from bank accounts um, and savings accounts and checking accounts to prepaid cards to obviously different kinds of loan products and credit products that all, um, you know, often depend on, on looking at somebody's consumer credit report before making any underwriting and decisioning processes. So just to give a couple of examples of where we've really seen banks and um, nonprofits partner um, um, based on our platform and, and, and really pushing things forward. Um, Bonanza is a CDFI. Um, we know that a lot of financial institutions um, will um, lend to CDFIs or make grants to CDFIs so they can do that, that first time lending so that people can get access to the credit they need to build credit. Um, so Antonio de Leon has a store um, successful entrepreneur and, um, and yet didn't have access to credit, um, was able to get a micro loan and through that one micro loan after a year had his first credit score ever, which turned out to be a 705. Um, and so he was thrilled because he was then able to go access um, additional credit to make additional improvements to his store. Um, and that's really a place where you can kind of see that really helping somebody get access to a responsible product that they can pay on time really is very important. Another example that kind of takes it in a different direction is innovative changes. Um, and um, we're really um, challenging a lot of our nonprofits right now to think about how they're building meaningful credit histories and how that history and that good credit is then leading to increased savings for that. Because at the end of the day, right, we want people to save money, um, have better access. And so you can see here that they were able to give a pay the alternative, very small loan 
Um, instead of this person going to a regular payday lender, it saved them $96. They then were doing budgeting with them and, and working on behavior change where they could find savings of $18 a month. They helped them find a better checking account for the kinds of activities that they were doing, which was able to save this person hundreds of dollars in overdraft fees every month, which had been also almost being used like another payday loan alternative. Um, they were able to renegotiate student loans um, based on the income of this person. Um, and then through this process um, and the relationship with the credit union, so the bank relationship that was happening with any checking account, um, they eventually were able to actually qualify for a personal loan at the credit union, which was even um, lower interest than the CDFI was able to offer. And so again, saving more savings from that, that payday loan. And then eventually this person was able to actually purchase a more cost um, and fuel efficient car and so we're seeing even more monthly. And so we can kind of really see all the different ways that a nonprofit can kind of provide that incentive, getting people out of much more um, high cost predatory products into a CDFI and then eventually into a financial institution um, where the, the client, in this case Anita, could really build a relationship to meet many of her other needs beyond just um, a payday loan alternative. So um, just in conclusion, we really see this power of partnership. Um, CBA is really excited to be able to foster different partnerships between nonprofits and help them partner with financial institutions. As I mentioned, the you know um, working with a nonprofit that's offer, able to offer a microloan, whether it's a payday loan alternative or a microloan to an entrepreneur, can really help that consumer entrepreneur demonstrate credit worthiness um, for, uh, and make better bank referrals because that person now has a credit history. So you're not making a personal referral. You can actually send your client to any bank and they can have their credit report speak for them. Um, we know that banks are hosting a lot of savings accounts that can secure different kinds of loans. So we're looking at how different bank partnerships through IDA programs and savings programs can really go to the next level. And um, finally, we really see um, a lot of places where there are thousands more nonprofits that are not going to ever be set up to make their own loans. And so wanting to partner with financial institutions who, um, and help them with the targeted marketing that um, Kate was talking about earlier that they can really offer secured credit cards or credit builder loan products. Um, and the, in this case, the nonprofit might be able to help market it. In some cases, may be able to even help deliver it out of their offices. And so be that partner in, in terms of getting people directly into a product. Um, and CBA is always looking for um, new ways to help nonprofits. So our newest venture is um, thinking about some of the new, again, alternative data, that longer term goal that CFSI was talking about and thinking about how we might be able to empower nonprofits that are working um, as landlords for affordable housing and think about how they might be able to leverage some of the potential um, current and future opportunities to really leverage and build credit with rent. And so um, thank you very much for this opportunity to get to present that, Kate. Great. Thanks so much, Vicki. So then um, I want to hand it back over to Natalie once more to give us some concluding thoughts on credit building strategies and, and what city is working on today. Thank you, um, Kate. Um, you know, this is fascinating, and I I'm, and I hope that um, you found this as uh, as interesting and informative um, as we did. And I I did come away with a couple of takeaways that um, I'm happy to share. And you know, first premise that we started with and we end with is the fact that credit scores are very they're very dynamic. Um, they're they're complicated um, and there's lots of different variables that um, affect them and um, and there's no one really simple um, you know one size fits all nor is there one size fit all in terms of improving a credit score and I think you've got to know that going in as you think about um, your own uh, line of work and how are you going to um, handle this issue. Um, I really like the fact that we highlighted and the study highlighted and our partners highlighted how financial capability really has to be embedded in the credit building effort. There are really lots of tools out there um, and that when you begin to incorporate them you know, into um, your daily life as a consumer, you really have much more control over that credit score than maybe you, you really um, um, thought you had. You know, I'm addicted to how-to books, um, and you know, I can spend hours, you know, figuring out how to count calories or shave calories or you know, find the fat and the fiber content. 
I think that it's the same sort of rigorous approach to this in terms of being able to understand the information and then have it affect your behavior in order to become more economically well, um, uh, well-being. Um, the other thing is how important really financial products and services are in terms of being able to work with consumers to manage and rebuild their credit scores and what an important role they play um, in, in getting the credit building environment really um, appropriate for an individual consumer. And it, you know, it again harkens back to the fact that the, the, pr the principles of responsible finance that we embrace are making sure that the customer really understands what a product and a service is um, and how and walk them through how it will benefit them um, in their daily life so that they again can achieve economic security. And that really is a, is a is both hand in hand. Um, you know, with the with the credit building process. I mean, I think it was Vicky who said, you know, um, uh, uh, credit is a financial asset, and you really have to look at both sides of your you know your balance sheet when you're thinking about this. Certainly, the the the, the paper and the findings are very consistent with um, recent CFPB guidance, um, and that is that products and services must embed real value to the customer, um, and also by promoting positive financial behavior change and transparency. And that really has to underpin everything that we do um, as a way of working with um, con consumers. And then that um, there are lots of strategies um, that we can uh, look at. There is a roadmap. Um, I'm sure you're going to find that there will be a lot of uh, testing and experimenting and course correction as we address uh, as we address this issue, but certainly, um, as you could hear, uh, you know, also from um, you know from Ken, and certainly some of the other work that CFSI does, um, is is that there there are there are methodologies and ways to address this, and I really do uh, look forward to uh, working with the partners that uh, presented today and all of you on the phone as we navigate this um, you know circuitous path. And with that, I, again, thank you for attention and give it back to you, Kate, for questions. Great. Thanks so much for those concluding thoughts, Natalie. Um, and thanks to Vicki and Ken as well for your presentation. So um, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time left. We only have about five minutes and lots of questions, but we'll try to get through a couple before we conclude. So um, I'll start with a question for Ken. Um, Ken, have you seen any kind of data or have you done any analytics to determine um, the impact of Credit Karma on customers? Sure. Well, we have a lot of anecdotal information uh, that says that we get a lot of positive selection associated with people who actually use our, a service like ours. Uh, from a purely empirical basis, we have one study that shows that when we when we match samples of our users against a TransUnion nationalized sample, uh, we saw about a seven percent or a seven point increase uh, of credit scores uh, against what TransUnion saw for kind of the the control group, and that was over a period of about twelve months. So that's our only empirical data. But like I said, I, I think a lot of our partners, our issuing partners in particular have pointed out that we do tend to have a little bit more of a positive selection aspect. And, and it makes sense, right? People who are interested in monitoring their credit are generally interested in, in doing it for kind of the upside and not the downside. Great, thanks. Um, and here's a question for, for Natalie. So um, from, from a bank perspective, what obstacles do you see in offering or promoting secured cards? Um, well, I, I don't necessarily see it as a um, as an obstacle. I think that um, we have a couple of uh, of actual pilots um, that are being uh, implemented in a, a few markets where um, uh, we have um, uh, bank trade areas where we are doing um, uh, offering secured cards. I would say that. One of the lessons we have learned, and, and this has got as much to do with our bank footprint um, as anything else, is that we do um, value the third-party intermediary. I mean, we've really learned the lesson that 
um, on the ground trusted third party advisors, you know, whether it's, you know, a not for profit um, who offer services like Credit Builders Alliance or others, is really um, a, a, a good fit for us when we offer the card because there is a fair amount of financial capability and, um, and training. And, you know, the, the, the goal always is to align the right product with the needs of the consumer. So you've really got to understand what that, who that consumer is and what they need, um, and then you, you, the barriers don't become a factor at all. Great. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, and here we have a question for Vicki. Um, so, Vicki, how do partnerships get started between banks and nonprofits? Are they typically initiated by the bank or nonprofit, or have you seen both? I think we've seen a lot of both. Um, and I'm trying to think of some specific examples. I mean, I think that um, there are several places, especially in the last few years, where I think banks are, as um, Citi just noted, really identifying the value of working through a third party and so um, are looking at their footprint and looking at who they want to be serving in that footprint and what third parties might already be serving that. And so possibly reaching out to nonprofits and or other partners to see if they would be good partners and good delivery mechanisms or, or um, support targeted marketing. And so I think that um, that's been really exciting to see um, and kind of put some of the CRA, you know, stuff over its head a little bit, which is helpful, right, in terms of really seeing this as a partnership where um, there's a win-win for everybody. Um, there's still some, some complications there to work out in terms of um, how comfortable different nonprofits feel in terms of potentially marketing or selling a specific product. Um, from any specific bank. Um, they often leverage lots of different kinds of bank partnerships in their community, and they often want to be able to give consumers a choice. And so there's been a lot of conversation and discussion about the pros and cons of those different models. I think traditionally we've seen lots of nonprofits reaching out to banks because their mission and their goal is to help people become financially secure. And so by definition, they're often funded to do programs and projects that require opening up bank accounts and serving the underbanked and unbanked um, wanting to get um, loans out and they often look at banks to capitalize their loan funds and be partners in that way, um, especially CDFIs and micro lenders. And so I think um, I think you, you see a lot of, of both of that going on. And so I think that as those banks and nonprofits get better at um, really defining the win-win, um, and um, I think we've seen credit building be a really big pathway um, for a better conversation because I do think it levels the, the conversation, the playing field, and, and, and helps those organizations discuss an indicator that's really relevant to both the consumer as well as to the bank and financial institution. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Um, and so one last quick question in the last couple minutes we have um, for Ken. Is Credit Karma going mobile or is it available already on mobile? Uh, so yeah, we'll actually have a mobile application launching within the next couple of weeks, and I, I think that we're most excited about the fact that the mobile application will have push notifications for monitoring. So the key part of that is, you know, if something important is changing in your credit, you'll all have a, a free way to access that information from your phone. Great. All right. Well, um, I think that's it for today. That's all the time we have. So um, I want to say thanks once again to City Community Development and to Natalie um, for the support that you've given us on this project. And thanks also so much to Ken Lin and Vicki Frank for um, providing your thoughts and your great perspective on this topic. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of our stakeholders in the coming months. Thanks, everybody. Hey, could you give the uh, web, the link for the uh, paper for those who want to uh, have access to it? Um, you know, I don't have it available right at this minute, but we can certainly send it around to anyone. Um, I'll, I'll leave the screen up with my email address. So it, if anybody wants the paper, please send me an email and I'll follow up with that. Great, thanks. thanks. That, Natalie. All right, thanks everybody.